So, my name is Rami Kawash. I am a software architect at Qualys. I head up uh, malware detection services for the company. Uh, we're based out of Seattle. Well, Qualys is based out of San Francisco, but my team is based out of Seattle, where it's currently 40 degrees cooler than it is here, and I'd much rather be there, to be perfectly honest. So, today we're going to talk about Neptune, uh, our project for detecting and dissecting web-based malware threats. Um, and that's done through browser and operating system instrumentation. So jumping into the agenda. Uh, first, we'll take a little bit of time and talk about the threat landscape, um, how we got here, uh, why it's important. Um, we'll do a quick um, kind of anatomy of a, of a typical exploit attempt uh, through the web browser vector, and we'll just talk about how that usually works. We'll talk about how these attacks are obfuscated and, and, and hidden. Uh, nobody just injects scripts into a page you know, without at least trying to mask the attempt um, at inside the legitimate content. We'll talk a little bit about the attack vectors that these exploit attempts take, um, and I'll give you a little bit of an overview on the approach that we take to detect and dissect uh, said exploits. Uh, from there, we'll talk about methodologies. We use three, static, heuristic, and behavioral, and we kind of blend them together to make a, a determination of malicious intent. Um, that'll dovetail into a, a quick conversation about API hooking. Um, we'll also enumerate all the different parts of the operating system and the browser that we instrument in order to do all of this stuff. Um, and then it'll actually get interesting. Uh, we're going to dissect three different uh, exploit scripts. Um, I stayed away from binary buffer overruns and, and those kind of uh, exploits for this particular talk just because it requires a little too much in-depth information and that would have monopolized pretty much the entire 60 minutes if we were to do it in depth. Uh, then we'll move on to a live demo, which hopefully will not blow up in my face. I'm, I'm running, I think, 0 for 4 this year on demos. I've had hardware failure, network connectivity go down. So hopefully, you know, that luck will change a little bit. And then we'll do the Q&A. So threat landscape. Um, it wasn't that long ago, maybe 10 years, five years, even less, where if you wanted to own a machine, all you had to do was, you know, scan a network, look for a machine that was responding to ports, run a complete port scan on it, look up known um, versions of services running and listening on ports, send it an evil packet, and bam, you just got yourself a new machine, do with it whatever you please. Um, those days, sadly, well, sadly for malware authors, maybe not so sadly for the rest of us, are dead. Um, I'm not saying this doesn't happen anymore, but it's very rare. And the main reason that it's very rare is the operating system vendors woke up, and they got their act together, um, they locked down their base configurations, they turned firewalls on by default, they introduced auto-updating. I'm actually talking predominantly about Microsoft here. They, they really cleaned up their act. Right now, if I wanted to own a machine remotely on the network, it would be tough. It would be probably not worth the amount of effort required to do it. And if I had an exploit that did that, it would be worth a lot of money. So if I'm trying to distribute malware, what do I do? Well, I'm trying to get my wares out, and I'm kind of lazy, so I want to probably go after something a little bit easier to attack. So in comes the modern web browser. So um, I hear this a lot. Uh, Google says, you know, the browser is becoming the operating system. Well, that's not always a good thing, because it's becoming a lot like the operating system in terms of its attack surface. Uh, browsers are hugely feature-rich. They have they do everything. They play media. They, they let you watch videos. They redirect. They it's, it's crazy how much you can do with a web browser. It is literally becoming the new operating system. Um, and that means it's really easy to exploit. And ergo, eh, ergo, you got a bunch of malware authors going, oh, well, we just got to trick someone into getting to a web page, and we can attack this nice, juicy target instead of going after this hardened operating system, which I can't seem to find bugs in anymore. So that's why this talk is kind of important. Um, so the, we're kind of in the you know, midlife of, of, of the drive-by download era, where uh, you know, they're still picking up, but, it, and it, but they're starting to get covered a little bit now. Uh, and they're increasingly prevalent. Um, I've heard some scary statistics. Um, I'll quote one, even though I'm not quite sure of its veracity, but uh, one in 10 web pages has some form of malicious content in it. Uh, that is quote by Google, but it's two years old. I don't know what that stat has done, but it's probably gone up in, you know, since then. And I'm not quite sure about the methodology, so don't, don't hold me to it. But I think everyone in the room will agree there's a lot of web-based malware. 
So we should probably figure out how to do something about it. But before we do that, we should talk a little bit about the anatomy uh, of a web-based attack. Um, the first step into attacking someone's web browser is getting them to visit your site, or better yet, compromising a legitimate site that they would naturally go to and attacking through um, you know, an injection type method. Um, so typical Joe user with an unpatched browser and an unpatched operating system visits uh, some new site that they commonly go to. Um, a hacker or malicious party, if you will, will inject a script uh, either through syndicated content, through an ad, or by just compromising the machine itself and putting it directly in the page um, onto that, that, that le otherwise legitimate content. Uh, that evil script will load and execute within that person's browser. Um, it will render, and at that point, you have a very large attack surface uh, as a malware author to attack. It's very easy to find a plugin or attack a parsing algorithm or what have you. It's, it's a very easy vector. So evil script loads and executes. We find some sort of vulnerability. That vulnerability is exploited. And poor Joe user joins a botnet and helps generate revenue for the Russian mob by click farming or whatever scenario you want. That seems to be a popular one. Um, but nobody will just inject any old evil script into a page for anyone to see, for AV engines to pick up. It's just that that's be too simple, too easy to avoid, and too easy to clean up. So there's a million and one ways to misdirect and, and hide what you're doing. Um, I can inject um, a hidden iframe into pretty much any page and have that iframe point off to another iframe, which will then point up to a script, which will then put up, pull out down a script from another source. Um, so lots of indirection, lots of methods of getting your exploit code on to the page that's being rendered by the user's browser. Um, there's other cute little things like deceptive linking, making a URL hard to read by escaping characters, so on and so forth. And, and, don't want to spend too much time on it. Uh, but I do want to call out two that are kind of cute. I like mimicking common elements. Um, Google Analytics, the sample code they give you, already looks obfuscated. So what a great attack vector to stick uh, an exploit into. If I'm going to have obfuscated code on there, I might as well just make it look like a Google Analytics um, script block. Um, obfuscation we'll get into a little bit more. Uh, there's some really, really nasty stuff you can do to make uh, JavaScript pretty much unreadable. and. Uh, my personal favorite in Bane is the selective exploitation. Um, what does that mean? If I go to a site and it's malicious, it may choose not to infect me. It may say, oh, I've already infected your IP within the last five hours. I'm not going to infect you again. Or, no, I only infect on Mondays. Please come back Monday. So that makes it hellish for someone trying to do detection to figure out, OK, did this script not work? Is it not serving malicious content? Or are they just don't feel like exploiting me right now? So that's kind of like the, the biggest gripe I have when I'm trying to repro something or do a demo, and uh, probably run into that later on, given my track record. Um, exploit scripts. They t typically take one of three attack vectors. They're either going to go after the core browser, uh, the renderer, uh, or the, uh, the script interpreter, or the URL parser, or something along those lines. Or they're going to go after a core system vulnerability, or they're just going to exploit a uh, third-party pl plugin, which is going to have a million holes in it, because that's just the way third-party plugins seem to be written. Um, and there are some examples there. I'll just quickly list them off. The IE peers, uh, MS10.18, uh, VML parsing, WF parsing. Uh, the ones that are actually kind of, we're going to talk a little bit later, are the vulnerability in the help and support center, the HPC protocol, which is actually core OS vulnerability. Um, and uh, we'll also do a, a JDK, a Java Development Toolkit, and an MDAC one. Uh, MDAC is like probably the most brain dead exploit you could possibly do. And we'll go into that a little bit later. So how do we do this? How does Neptune work? Um, Neptune basically takes a vulnerable operating system, a vulnerable browser, runs both under virtualization, visits a web page, uh, and extracts logs of everything that happens on that machine during the render process. There's no user interaction. We just go, we visit the page, and we log everything that happens. Um, the type of virtualization you use is completely irrelevant, but just FYI, we use VMware. It's cheap. Um, and this one is actually a little bit more important. The instrumented OS of choice is, is Windows XP 
and it's an IE6 browser. Now we chose those because of not only their prevalence, but their increased mind share in, in exploitability, if you will. Uh, a lot of exploit scripts will, will target um, the nice low-hanging fruit that is IE6 running on XP unpatched. Um, from all that data, we determine malicious intent. Um, how do we determine malicious intent? Well, we'll get into that a little bit right here. So the first method is a purely behavioral method. So I don't care about the input into the browser. I don't even watch what's going on in the network. All I do is look at what the IE process is doing while rendering a page. Um, so there are certain things you can assume a browser will and will not do without the user telling it to. There is no good scenario for IE launching another process uh, while rendering a page unless the user tells it to. There's no good reason it should read your private data. There's no good reason it should delete your private data. There's no good reason it should reset your home page. again, without you telling it to. So from that base set of knowledge, what we, we can build what we call a behavioral profile for the browser. Uh, this is what the browser will do under normal circumstances. Anything that deviates from that is abnormal, therefore a behavioral detection. So this technique has a lot of pro a lot going for it. Um, there's a near zero false positive rate, and I've got a big old asterisk there, because anytime you state an absolute, the universe is going to conspire to prove you wrong. Uh, it's nearly perfect assuming, A, your behavioral profile is bang on, you haven't missed anything, uh, and B, you don't have any bugs in your code. Uh, but given those two somewhat reasonable assumptions, um, you can pretty much say, I witnessed a behavioral detection, I know absolutely that this is a malicious page because my browser was compromised and something bad happened on my machine. Oh, by the way, here is what that something bad is. Um, another big plus is uh, this method is pretty much immune to most forms of obfuscation. Um, assuming that you're, you're doing the logging correctly, there's no way to obfuscate the fact that I launched a process. There's, there are certain messages you could do, but they're really, really difficult to accomplish in shell code as part of an exploit. They're, they're not really practical. Um, and the third kind of pro that I point out is that it detects new threats. I don't need to know about the exploit you're using. I don't need to know anything about what you're doing. It could be a brand new zero day, or it could be a seven-year-old vulnerability you're exploiting. I just need you to succeed. And if you succeed in compromising me, I'm going to know about it. It's a big plus. So with that, unfortunately, comes some negatives. The biggest one is uh, I cannot detect an attempt at an exploit with this method. Either you succeed or you don't. If you don't succeed, I'm not going to get a behavioral detection. So with that, you know, ergo, there are some false negatives. Um, exploit scripts are notoriously bad in terms of coding quality. They're, they're, they work most of the time, but sometimes they don't. Uh, sometimes they require an internet resource to be up and it's down. Or sometimes the exploit that they're exploiting, ex the vulnerability that they're exploiting, um, is non-deterministic, uh, where it only works some of the time. Um, if I'm doing heap spray and I just didn't spray enough, I jumped to the wrong place, I crap. A lot of this will result in browser crashes and things like that. Um, so that's another kind of uh, uh, knock against this method of detection. And the last is it's computationally prohibited to do all this in runtime. There's a lot of stuff that you have to log. There's a lot of stuff you have to watch, and your rules have to be pretty much bang on. But of the detection methods, this is probably the strongest because uh, of its zero false positives and, before, and because you need zero foreknowledge of the, the exploit being attempted. Um, the second one is a lot simpler. It's just static. So opposite approach. I'm not looking at the browser process. I'm only looking at the data being fed into the browser. I'm looking for particular attack patterns. Uh, this is very similar to traditional antivirus. Uh, it's a signature-based approach. So. While I personally don't like this method, it has a lot going for it as well. It's, it's very quick. It's very, very computationally cheap. Um, signatures are easily updated and, and shared around. It, it's the reason that any virus companies take this approach. It, it's pretty, pretty simple and it's pretty first gen. Um, and it doesn't require success. So even if your exploit fails and still looks like a known exploit, I'm going to pick it up. So that, that's a plus. Um, cons.